constitution, actually, Mr. Speaker, sir, for the first time, we have a constitution that specifically recognizes the rights of persons with disability. Specific provision in the constitution, section 42, Honorable Levere led, read the particular provision. I thank him for relying on the constitution. And also section 26, section 26, which is the uh, non-discriminatory provision uh, in the constitution. I think, Mr. Speaker, sir, from that actually then stems the whole ethos, the whole policy drive about what we should do in the disability space. So we have seen, as highlighted by the members uh, on, on this side of parliament, we now have uh, sign language uh, interpreters for parliamentary sessions. We see some of the news stations now having sign language. And it has become more the norm than the exception. This never happened previously. Mr. Speaker, sir, this also reminded the members of, of parliament for the first time in the very few countries in the world where the constitution actually is translated into the Braille language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the English language and the Ethiopia language, it's in the Braille language. So any person with disability, in particular who cannot read uh, and doesn't have you know, eyesight, can read the constitution itself. And I think that in itself, Mr. Speaker, sir, is very empowering and does send a very strong message. Um, a lot of the issues have, in fact, been highlighted, but I, I fail to um, grasp the logic. Uh, Honorable Randrondro is very sort of line focused on one particular budget line item. As we've seen, for example, with women or youth groups, when we look at budgetary allocation, we need to look at it holistically. It's not only rest with the Ministry of Women, Children, Poverty, Elevation. It's the entire budget. And I'd like to read that, Mr. Speaker, sir because the allocation for disabilities, in fact, spread throughout a number of ministries. So I'll read the actuals for last year's budget. We spent $9 million for allowance for persons with disability. And again, let me reiterate, never before in Fiji did persons with disability actually receive a monthly allowance. $90, sir. $90. It's a, it's a modest sum. It is a modest sum, and we would like to, of course, in increase it. But the fact is, it has, it has been introduced for the first time. Yeah, yeah. And she knows it was never done before. Grants to organizations for persons with disability, $379,428.35. This is, I'm talking about 2020-21. Economic empowerment of persons with disabilities, $4,000. Implementation of rights of persons with disabilities uh, under the Disabilities Act, $10,755. Fiji Council for Disabled Persons, $416,567.57. Bus fare program for old and disabled persons or elderly persons, $3.45 million. Western Disability Center, Disability Center did not exist in the West, a new one has been built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The completion for the last round was $237,000. Overall cost is $800,000. Grant to Hilton Special School Early Intervention, $652,000. We've been giving them this grant since 2017, 2018. And in fact, more than $652,000. Scholarship scheme for special children or special needs students, $194,000. We now have disabled students, blind students, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, who actually are now graduates at university level. Mr. Speaker, sir, grant to special schools, special education, $772,930. Mental health awareness, $17,331. Prosthesis unit, $46,579. Crutches, $9,905. Fiji Albinism Awareness Program, $9,139. This was the actual spend, which is $15.15 million last year alone, Mr. Speaker, sir. So far, Mr. Speaker, sir, from 2016-2017 financial year to the 2020-21 financial year, a total of $62 million has been expended yeah, yeah. in this particular space. Yeah, yeah. This year's budget, we have $18.9 million allocated for these respective areas. So again, Mr. Speaker, sir, I think it is very you know, uh, short-sightedness on the part of the opposition to just look at one line item. They need to look at it holistically as to what the spend is. More specifically regarding this particular audit, Mr. Speaker, sir, the point has been made that when you actually have a new law in place and then within one year you want to look at your ability to perform under the law, in particular if you're going to address 
decades and decades, in fact, a hundred years of neglect of that particular sector, then obviously the audit does not carry much merit. That's the point. In the same way the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker, sir, did so with the SDG performance. Within one year of the announcement of the SDG, then they simply then said, okay, well, let's do an audit as to how we're performing under this. That's the point. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Honorable um, uh, Nawai Kula said, you know, OAG is the only independent office. He doesn't actually acknowledge the fact that members of this, par of this parliament, particularly from the other side, have attacked other independent organizations, including the judiciary. So suddenly now suits them to say, OAG is the only independent body. This level of hypocrisy really should not exist. We want to have a good, healthy debate. Mr. Speaker, sir, the other point I wish to also make is that persons with disability, Mr. Speaker, sir, one of the uh, Honorable Koya, I think, mentioned that when you look at disability, it's also about the ability to access income, the ability to be mainstream into society. In 2016, we started a 300% tax deduction for any organization or employer that employs a disabled person, if they employ them, they're able to claim a 300% tax deduction on the salary that they paid them for the year. In 20, uh, 2019, 2020, we increased it to 400%. So we are encouraging employers yeah, yeah. to actually employ persons with disability. We need to look at all of this holistically. Honorable uh, Minister Akbar also highlighted the buses. Some of them, I know, are fairly old. We've reduced the duty, in fact, zero rated duty, so the bus companies can actually import buses, newer buses with newer technology. In fact, most of the buses in Fiji are fairly high, as we all know, Mr. Speaker, sir. Now, we have to do a retrofitting of those buses. Question is, we need to bear, somebody needs to bear the cost. And let me bring a point. Honorable Nawai Kula said, disabled persons used to get free bus fare. He actually failed to mention, again being disingenuous, in around about 2008, 2009, when the world price of fuel escalated to about 145 US dollars a barrel, the bus companies, which are all privately owned in Fiji, were clamoring for a bus fare increase. At that time, the government then struck a deal with them that, okay, we'll increase the bus fare, but you must make persons with disability to travel for free. Even taxi companies or taxi owners agreed to carry them with a particular level of discount. That's how free bus fare started. After a few years, the bus companies came back and said, we no longer want to carry them for free. We no longer want to carry them for free. That's when we started the, the, uh, the bus fare voucher system. Then, we, of course, we have the e-ticketing cards for that. That's how it started. So again, you see, he's not giving full information. That's how it started, Mr. Speaker, sir. And then, of course, we had also asked them to carry people over the age of 65 for free. They said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And then we started the bus fare subsidy for all the pensioners. Yeah, yeah. That's what we did. Yes, there has been some reduction in the transportation allowance that was given because of COVID-19. We were asked this in, in uh, Wainunu area, Honorable Nawaikula, where you come from, in that area, where people asked actually say, why is that, why has the bus fare uh, allowance been reduced? We explained to them why. And they actually understood more than you, Honorable Nawaikula. They understood that. They appreciated the fact. What they were also very complimentary about was the fact that now disabled people and ordinary people can take advantage of the fact that through uh, FRA and Ministry of Rural Development and the Commissioner's Office, a number of crossings have in fact not been only retrofitted but in fact completely replaced with new ones. And they can now have better access to Sabu Sabu and various other places. Mr. Speaker, sir, the other point I, I wish to also make is that The uh, Fiji Human Rights Commission, we talked a lot about that, Honorable Ronronro. Of course, commissioners change. And of course, that knowledge transfer needs to be there, and knowledge transfer does take place, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. And we have, if you see, the Human Rights Commission used to be known only as the Human Rights Commission, but it's now called the Fiji Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission, precisely for these reasons, because we've seen tremendously throughout our history Persons with disability have also been discriminated, as have been women and other uh, groups that have been on the margins. We've allowed the repertoire on albinism to come to Fiji. Look at our policies. They visited Fiji and look at how we can actually improve our uh, particular 
you know, uh, policies and how we can improve that. Mr. Speaker, sir, the, the last point I wanted to make is that this specific report, I don't think the report actually makes a mention of the fact that public transportation in Fiji is actually public, is privately owned. It's all privately owned. Government does not run those bus services. It's privately owned. We have seen in the past particular bus companies take the latitude because they're the only bus operator in that particular area, decide not to run the bus service. Decide not to run the bus service. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, these are the hardcore realities we have to deal with. We are currently looking at, for example, how we can encourage more private sector players to, in fact, participate in our objective to ensure that we have access to transportation. We have announced, Mr. Speaker, sir, that we're building a bus terminal for what we call the suburban terminal services in Vale Levu. Work has already been tendered out. One of the requirements, as we're talking to LTA, one of the requirements will be that the buses that will run in this area will be smaller buses, but they must have the ability to have disabled persons <coughs> board and off board in a friendly manner, yeah, yeah. which requires that the lower buses, in fact, it's a lot easier for them to lower the steps down so people with disability or people with wheelchairs can actually get on the buses. Because that's one of the requirements now, Mr. Speaker, sir. So a lot of work, in fact, has been done behind the scenes and a lot of, of work is currently being done, Mr. Speaker, sir. I mean, I'm sure if the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker, sir, wanted to look at performance, if the Auditor General actually looked at the performance from the perspective of how much monies have been allocated, we'd have got a different report altogether. They know, they know that within one year you cannot retrofit all the buses in Fiji. Everybody knows that. In the same way, they have not acknowledged the fact that now FRA has been doing for the past few years, if you go down Suva now, a lot of the footpaths actually have a ramp. Before, they never had ramps. So if I'm on a wheelchair, if I want to cross the road, I have to go over this bump. Now most of them actually have a ramp. Of course, a lot more needs to be done. But there was a specific funding allocation, as Honorable Bala will tell me, Minister of Infrastructure, where we said, break down the cement, put a ramp. So that's all being done because there's no point getting on the bus. When you get off the bus, then you can't access the footpath. So a lot of work, in fact, has been done. And unfortunately, the Office of the Auditor General, once again, has very miserably failed to take a holistic view of it. And also carried out an audit in a specific area where they know even beforehand your ability to comply with these standards would be very difficult to meet within one year. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, I think, you know, the, we, we need to see the... The, the, the wood from the trees. And that is, we need to look at the big picture. Of course, a lot more needs to be done. And of course, I'm sure that maybe the LTA at certain times aren't necessarily enforcing that. But that in itself begs a moral question. Here we are in Fiji, having the, through the Minister for Transport, put in place regulations to tell bus companies, make sure you carry the disabled person. Make sure you reserve seats for them. In many countries, the corporates themselves, the bus companies themselves, will come up with their own policy. They will do it themselves, but here we have to handhold every single thing. We have to tell them, make sure your bus driver stops, otherwise it's an offence. Make sure you uh, keep the first row of seats, otherwise it's an offence. Make sure you put a signage. So we need to look at overall our attitude. Our attitude towards people with disabilities. Is it just here for us to grandstand in this parliament? Or is it about actual moral values and how we actually value these people and give them a particular right in society? Honorable Minister Akbar said that, I think quite succinctly, that we ourselves need to change our attitudes too, Mr. Speaker, sir. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to uh, thank the committee for their report. And uh, we, we hope that this is not going to be a political football. And the reality of the matter is that we need to address this area and there's progressive realization of these rights and we have expended that much money and we indeed hope to do so more so in the future. And by the way, many of us actually have been to Brown Street for many, many decades actually. And we've been down to the Frank Hilton School too. So please, let's not patronize us by saying go down to Brown Street just because one person may have done one or two visits. Mr. Speaker, sir, thank you. I thank the Acting Prime Minister, please contribution.